Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. Today, I want to talk about freedom in action. Freedom in action. And I was thinking of this uh, passage from Isaiah chapter 53, and uh, the prophet is speaking about Jesus, right? So, and we're talking about hundreds of years before Jesus comes, and the accuracy is insane. But in Isaiah 53 verse 2, he says this, he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him, which means Jesus was not good looking, Okay? He was not Fabio Jesus. He wasn't Brad Pitt Jesus. He wasn't, you know, he was a very normal dude. And there was nothing about his outer appearance that drew people to him. However, what we see in the New Testament is that people were drawn to Jesus from the disciples that he called to the, the kind of the, the hundreds of disciples that wound up following him to the, the thousands of people that would show up at, the, at the, uh, the public, I guess, appearances of Jesus, right? So Jesus drew people from all over the place. And the question is, how does he do that? And what was it about Jesus that was so attractive if it wasn't a physically attractive Jesus? And of course, we know that he taught with authority and he performed signs that were just mind blowing. And of course, that drew a crowd around him. He exuded true holiness. But there's something about Jesus that enabled him to do all of those things. Something that must have been so incredibly attractive about his very person. What I want to make a case for is that Jesus exuded a freedom that people had never seen before. Like the freest person to ever walk the planet was Jesus Christ. He exuded freedom. Jesus was freedom in action. And if you've known people who um, are just so comfortable in their own skin, there's something about them that's just kind of, attractive, right? When, when you see somebody who just, they're just so confident or they're just so comfortable, they're, they're not worried about what people are thinking about them all the time, but there's, there's just something about them that is attractive to us. You know, today we follow leaders that are confident and, and competent and charismatic and they're cool under fire and all those things are great things, right? But leaders today probably learn how to at least appear to be those things. They appear to have those qualities. But Jesus had all of those qualities, and it wasn't an appearance. He wasn't putting on something. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't posturing himself. Jesus truly was free. It reminded me of another passage. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says this, imitate me, as I imitate Christ. Now, you and I, when we think about imitating Jesus, we kind of know, like, the goal of being a follower of Jesus is my life looks more and more like Christ. I want to be Christ-like. That's the term that we use for that, right? To imitate Christ. And we probably think about Jesus' love. We think about his humility. We think about his holiness, But have you ever considered imitating Jesus' freedom? That you, as a person, would become more and more comfortable in who God made you to be in such a way that people are like, wow, what is it about that person? There's something about you that's really attractive to me, and it's not about, you know, the outer stuff. The freedom of Jesus. So I just want to ask 
What does it look like to live in freedom in action? What, what is it like to be freedom in action? And what effect might that have on us and on the people around us? All right? Luke chapter 13. We're going to look at a story. This is one of the many amazing stories from the life of Jesus. Um, we're going to start in verse 10, and here's what Luke says. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. And I'm just going to guess that, you know, on the other six days of the week, nobody was getting healed at the synagogue. Okay. But that's what he told him to do. Verse 15. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites, exclamation point in my Bible. Doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things. He was doing this is the word of the Lord. Now, I love the stories of Jesus because we can imagine being there. Like we can kind of put ourselves in those shoes. And if you know anything about Luke who wrote this book, Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. So he wasn't there on that day. He wasn't watching all this, but Luke was rather, uh, he was the only non-Jew. He was a Gentile to write a book in the New Testament. And what he did, he was a doctor he, he would go and just hear all the accounts of Jesus from all these people who'd followed Jesus, and he was making an orderly account of those things for us in this gospel. And so he tells us this story, and it's a uh, synagogue would be like the Jewish church, and the leader of the synagogue would be like the pastor of that church. And we get a little... I don't know, glimpse into what it would be like if I, uh, if I were to sit down to say, to sit down today and say, Jesus is going to be teach teaching in my place today. And what happens when Jesus is leading the service on Sunday morning? Oh, things get really exciting at church, okay? It was an exciting day at the synagogue there, which, by the way, was on a Saturday, not on a Sunday. But this service gets a little crazy. It gets a little crazy. And I just want to connect the dots from what Jesus does in this moment to what freedom and action looks like. In verse 11, we see that this is a woman who has been disabled by a spirit. She's been disabled by a spirit. And if you are a King James Version kind of Christian, you might you know, read in your Bible, it says this, that she had a spirit of infirmity. And so that, that word infirmity is also translated as disability, weakness, disease, sickness, or frailty. So we, we, we see this woman, and I'm just imagining if, if I'm there and I'm kind of watching what's happening, that Jesus is talking and he's engaging with people. He's looking across, he's seeing their eyeballs, but there's one spot over there where he doesn't see eyeballs, he just sees kind of the top of somebody's back. And it's like he it catches his attention in that moment, and Jesus kind of steps into that moment in this incredible way, and we know the story of this woman. She'd been this way for 18 years. And I just want you to consider that for a minute. What would it be like to have a condition like that for 18 years? Maybe you've had a, a very debilitating illness or, 
or physical disability for a long time. And you might know what that's like, but the, the passage doesn't say anything about her having a husband. And my guess is that when she was younger and all the girls were pairing up with the local boys, she's hunched over. And so she never gets to experience that part of her life. I imagine that being in that condition would probably hinder her doing work. So there might have been financial hardship that she has because she just can't do what other people do. I, I, I imagine that her sleep might have been hindered. That there's something about being in that position all the time that would hinder her from sleeping well at night. So she would feel this like you know, daily. I wonder what it was like when someone said, hey, that rainbow is so beautiful or that sunset is just gorgeous or the, the moon is so beautiful tonight and she's just kind of like out of the corner of her eye just trying to see what everyone else is seeing. Like, can you imagine what this is doing to this person who has been in this condition for 18 years and like most of us, she just learned to live with it. She's learned to live with it. Right? Verse 16, he tells us just a little bit more about the situation. First, he says that um, she's a daughter of Abraham. Daughter of Abraham. Which we, we might think, well, he's just saying that she's Jewish, but he's at synagogue and everybody there's Jewish. And in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 16, we get the line which turned into the song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all pray. So that verse is all about the faith. Whoever has the faith of Abraham, he's the father of us all. And I think what Jesus is saying is, this is a woman who has real faith in God. It's real. She's not just an ethnic Jew, but she has a faith. She is a daughter of Abraham. And he tells us, in case we weren't sure from verse 11 about the whole spirit of disability thing, that she has been bound by Satan, which tells us something. It's a physical disability that a woman who has a very real faith has, and it has a spiritual cause. Now, for us here, we hear that and we're like, ah, I don't know about that, right? Like, really? You know, in our day, because we are more formed by the enlightenment than the light of the world, we think that all physical disabilities are just, just need physical solutions, right? So if you're bent over, go to the doctor. See what they say. Now, you know that at this time period, doctoring was very different than it is today. And one of the blessings of the Enlightenment was that people started to research science and, and we learned about medicine. And so medicine has advanced incredibly over these years. But what happened in the Enlightenment is it gave birth to rationalism. It gave birth to naturalism. And it gave birth to materialism. And what happened is that spiritual things were separated from natural things. So when you experience something in your natural person and you see something happen on, you know, around you, it's like that can't be spiritual because spiritual stuff is different. It's like quiet, it's private, it's internal. It's not this whole like natural world. And so there's this, this divide that happens in our minds that makes us question things like this, but this is God's word. And what Jesus did worked, and it reveals to us that physical problems can have spiritual roots. Now, please hear me. He does not say, Every physical problem has a spiritual root, okay? He doesn't say that. So we don't have to go like, you know, demon hunting all the time of like, what is that, you know? He's just saying, look, this is possible. It's possible. It challenges our mind. But I, I, I think what happened because of this is that 
people stopped looking to the church when they had physical problems, right? And instead, we go to the doctor, and you might find something that works for you. Praise God. Awesome. God gave us intelligence to, to do those things, and we bless that, right? But there are some times when the doctors cannot fix it. In fact, what we have are just more Band-Aids and not healing. And the other thing that happens because of that is the people of Jesus feel like idiots when they pray for sick people. You know what I'm talking about? It's one of the outcomes of that. And what's interesting, I think, is that uh, people are not less spiritual, they're just less Christian. And so... Um, we know people here in Richmond that practice Reiki. Have you ever heard of Reiki before? You guys have heard of that? So Reiki is spiritual healing without Jesus. It's called energy healing. And there's a pastor by the name of Dr. Rob Reamer. He's from the Northeast. His father had uh, been diagnosed with stage four leukemia, very, very terrible thing. Um, he was in a hospital that was the hospital that trains Harvard doctors. So these are smart people, very smart people, very intelligent people. And he said, I was blown away that every nurse, every nurse practitioner, and every doctor that came in to see my dad asked if we wanted them to administer Reiki healing. Whoa. And that's happening right here in the little old town of Richmond, Texas, guys. I guarantee you, we know people personally who are practicing these things. And here's what we find is that people are actually looking for spiritual solutions to physical problems. But we have lost a category for that as the church. And I think if we're gonna really open our eyes to see what the scriptures teach, there, there, there's a, a reclaiming of the categories that we find in the life of Jesus. And so Jesus, okay, he's, he's teaching, he's making eye contact, he sees the back hunched over, and for whatever reason, he just kind of knows in that moment exactly what's going on, and he says out loud, like T, uh, the, the T.D. Jakes thing, woman, thou art loosed. Woman, you are free from your infirmity. He just says, he declares it to her, and he lays his hands on that lady who's been that way for almost two decades. I mean, imagine that. And immediately, she straightens up, like the torso that's been bent over for 18 plus years just begins to straighten up, her shoulders turn up, her head can finally see, and just praise erupts out of this woman. It's amazing. It's amazing. Here's the first thing, and I think it's the, the simple point of the story, is that Jesus sets the oppressed free. Jesus sets the oppressed free. Free. Luke wants you to know. He, he put this in here for us to know what Jesus does in the life of people. He sets oppressed people free. And he doesn't tell us why it was there. He doesn't tell us what caused it. He doesn't go into the personal history of the woman or her family. All he tells us is that it was there and then it was gone. And the only thing that happened in between was Jesus right? Jesus sets the oppressed free. And I just want you to know that the gospel is the good news that we have spiritual solutions to physical problems, which is really good news if you've been in a condition for 18 plus years and the doctors don't know how to fix it. It's good news because we know that Jesus can free us from spiritual bondage and oppression. So if you felt darkness, if you felt irrational thoughts, if, if you felt suicidal thoughts, if you've been uh, kind of this overwhelming anxiety or, or overwhelming depression or overwhelming rage, if there's uncurable or undiagnosable illnesses, it could be spiritual. We don't know that all of it's spiritual. We're not saying it's all spiritual. But there's a category for us to know that it might be spiritual and we have a spiritual solution to spiritual problems. It's found in Jesus 
Christ. And it says, instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But wait, there's more. It's the second thing. Jesus, not only does Jesus set the oppressed free, but he operates in freedom. What do you mean, Chris? Okay, imagine you're leading the service. Put yourself in that spot. You're the one up front talking. And you also notice that there is a person who's hunched over. Now, would you point out the person that has the disability in the middle of that service? I'm gonna guess no, right? Why? Well, I don't wanna embarrass the person. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure what's going on. I don't know their story. I, I don't know what people are gonna think about me if I do that. So I'm not gonna do that, okay? And what I would say is that Jesus wasn't encumbered by all of those things. Does that make sense what I'm saying? He's operating in a freedom that you and I typically don't operate in. And I just want to identify three fears, and maybe you could expand and say, oh, no, there's actually more. But I just want to point out three, and I'm going to focus the most time on the very, very first one, because I think it's a fear that all of us feel. The first one is this. Jesus operates in freedom from the fear of man. Freedom from the fear of man. Here's what the fear of man is defined as. It's being controlled or mastered by the opinions and standards or the acceptance or rejection of other people. It's the belief that people can give you what you really need. When you're young, we call it peer pressure, right? How many of us did things when we were young that were dumb and were like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? It was peer pressure. Everybody was doing it and I just jumped right into because I just didn't want to be like the weird kid, right? I jumped in. When you get a little bit older, we start diagnosing it as people pleasing. Oh, I'm just a people pleaser. It's my personality type. I'm just prone to wanting to make everybody else happy. If it gets a little bit more progressed than that, we have clinical diagnoses. One is called androphobia. It is literally the fear of man, and it's like a paralyzing fear of people. We have another term called social anxiety disorder, where you're like, I just kind of, uh, when I'm around people, I get really anxious, right? So that kind of fear, by the way, is, it's a very real fear that many of us feel. I remember being, uh, I, as a young man, I was just really insecure. And if, uh, especially like an, a, an older person would, would just stop and look me in the face and ask me a pointed question, I would just kind of like melt. It was like, oh my gosh, like, why are you looking at me? Why, why are you talking to me, right? I was just so anxious about that. I stuttered. I, I mean, I had a stuttering problem. And here's the thing about this type of issue is, you know, the devil is a very sneaky guy. And he uses insecurities and he, he makes you think you're being humble. Oh, he's so humble. Oh, they're just so humble. They're just, they're just shy, okay? But what happens is we wind up focusing on ourselves all the time because we're shy because we're insecure, because we're just nervous around people. And Jesus operates in this freedom that is so beautiful that he's able to step into a moment in front of a whole group of people, which by the way, the number one fear of people is, anybody know? Public speaking. And I'm a pastor, so, you know, whatever. Thank you, God taking me from a insecure young man to now I stand in front of you guys every Sunday and I talk out loud for you to judge me. Isn't that great? Thank you, God. And if you've never struggled with the fear of man, please seek immediate medical attention because you are dead, okay? <laughs> Everyone, 
feels it. Everyone struggles with it. We've all had moments where we've walked into a room, we've walked in front of a certain group of people or whatever, and we just had that, like, the heart rate went up. We started to feel a little bit sweaty palms, a little nervous, right? Maybe it's that job interview. Maybe it's, you know, it could just be anything. We've all felt the fear of man. Ed Welch is a counselor. He wrote a book called When People Are Big and God Is Small. It's a powerful book. I highly recommend it. He says the quintessential verse, the classic text for the fear of man is this. It comes from Jeremiah 17, 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He makes human flesh his strength and his heart turns from the Lord. Think about that. The fear of man is so insidious. It's so terrible that, that the, the Lord says this. It, it is a curse that in making human flesh our strength that we will actually turn our hearts away from the Lord, meaning we will do the wrong thing because we're afraid of what people are going to say, what people are going to think, what people are, are going to do. It's the fear of man. And when we read a passage like this, and you see Jesus doing something that we would be really nervous to do, there's a couple ways that we have to be careful. The first way that we have to be careful is that we think he's rebel Jesus. Do you know what I'm talking about, rebel Jesus? He rides the Harley, he's got tattoos, his hair's blowing in the wind, and he's sticking it to the man, right? That's rebel Jesus. And if you're the rule, bre rule breaker kind of person that we talked about last week, you love that Jesus. You're like, that's my kind of a Jesus right there. But we know in 1 Samuel 15, 23, that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And we also know that in Romans 13, that the followers of Jesus are told to submit to authorities. So the whole rebel Jesus doesn't actually fit with the whole of the Bible. So Jesus is not rebel Jesus. He's not in rebellion. He's not operating in a spirit of rebellion. In fact, what Jesus does is he does the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, and his righteousness reveals rebellion. That the religious leader is actually in rebellion against the way of God. That's what happens. We, we think that maybe it's political Jesus. He's just picked the right day. He's got the moment all worked out in his mind. On Saturday at the synagogue, I'm going to heal somebody, and it's going to go bananas in there. The people are going to love it, but the religious leaders, they're going to hate me. Oh, my gosh. But I'm just going to stick it to those guys because Jesus has got an agenda. He's trying to trap these guys. Now, here's the thing is the Bible never, ever, ever, ever depicts that Jesus is the one trapping anyone, but it always depicts religious leaders are trapping Jesus in the things that he does and says. They're the ones operating in a political spirit against Jesus. So again, Jesus is not operating in either one of those things. Jesus is actually operating in freedom. And here's how we know this. Jesus got questioned in another place in John chapter 5. He went to a colonnade, Solomon's colonnade. And there's all these lame people, and there was a man who was there for 38 years. Jesus heals him on a Sabbath, and they question him, like, why would you do that? Here's what he says. Truly, I tell you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son likewise does, this, does these things. So why does Jesus heal this lady on the Sabbath day? Because the father was ready to heal the woman on the Sabbath day. And Jesus is so in tune, like he's, he's, he's got his priorities right. It's like, I'm not, I, I know what people are going to think. I know, I know all the dynamics right now, but I know God's calling me to do this right now. And he steps into it freely, 
freely. He's operating in freedom from the fear of man. And here's what that means for us. There is no wrong time to do the right thing. No wrong time. When you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. Ed Welch says it this way. He says, regarding other people, our problem is that we need them for ourselves more than we love them for the glory of God. The task God sets for us is to need them less and to love them more. Jesus is free in his love for other people and he's able to step into this moment because he's free from the fear of man. He's operating in love. So he's free from the fear of man. The second freedom is this, freedom from the fear of death. Freedom from the fear of death. Now you're like, what do you mean by that, Chris? Well, do you think that Jesus knows where all this is going? We know he knows, because in Luke 9, 22, he says, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, so all those religious people, be killed and be raised on the third day. So he absolutely knows where this is headed. And so Jesus, I'm just imagining if he's tempted in every way that we're tempted, in his earthly man, might have had a thought that, gosh, I know exactly where this is going. Do I really want to do this right now? I'm just going to start the beehive today. But Jesus clearly chooses to do what the Father is doing. And he's free from the fear of death. Now, most of us would prefer not to die. Amen? Amen. I have a fear of heights. When I go into high places and look over the edge, I feel like I'm going to faint or something, right? I'm like, please step away. And it's not that so much the heights, it's the fear of falling from the heights and dying, right? So it's kind of a fear of death, really. I don't want to fall off something and die, so I'd rather not go up there, which is all natural and it's all normal because we're born and we, all we know is life, and then dying is like scary to us, right? We all feel that. We all feel that. But dying is different from death. Dying is something that happens to 100% of human, human beings in all living things. It is a point in time where something happens to us, but death is the thing that's on the other side of dying. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. And so the good news of the gospel is that you and I have eternal life. Yeah. And so in Revelations, when it talks about these believers and it says that they overcame him by the word of the lamb and by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, I got that right, right? It says they did not love their lives to the point of death. There's something about this confidence that comes into the people of God when they understand that they don't have to be afraid of death. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says, Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. So it's natural for us to fear dying but it is supernatural to no longer be enslaved by the fear of death, which is what Jesus has come to give to you and I. Jesus can step into a moment that he knows is gonna, it's gonna lead, it's gonna lead to death for him, but he can do it freely. He can do it freely. Lastly, he's free from the fear of evil. He operates in freedom from the fear of evil. Here's what this means. The fear of evil is the false belief that the power of evil is as great or greater than the power of God. Thus you feel a paralyzing intimidation when confronted with spiritual evil. If you've ever watched horror movies that show, you know, demonization and 
exorcisms and all that kind of stuff, what is the effect of that supposed to make you feel? Terrified, Terrified afraid. You're like, I, I, I don't want anything to do with any of that stuff, right? And I think that Satan has two kind of primary guises. And the first guise is this, I'm not real. It's invisibility. You're, you're crazy if you think I'm real, right? Invisibility. The second one is this, invincibility. I'm stronger than you, more powerful than you. I'll kill you if you tangle with me. Those are the two ways that Satan kind of, kind of disguises himself. I'm invisible or I'm invincible. But we see here in this passage that Jesus has the power. He does not doubt at all that he can actually set that woman free. He is not afraid of whatever's going on with that lady. He can step right into it with freedom and confidence. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, this is the resurrected Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he speaks it to us today. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So who is the greatest over all things? We just saying about you reign above it all. Jesus reigns above it all. So when you face spiritual evil in your life, which you might feel that at times, you may, you may go through seasons where you just feel, I just feel heavy. I feel darkness or I feel like I'm under attack or I feel like someone in my family is under attack or I walk into my workplace and I feel this or, or whatever it might be. Like you face something, you're like, man, this feels like spiritual evil. Here's what you need to know. You can be free from the fear of that. You don't have to be intimidated. You have to be paralyzed because you know that Jesus rose from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father and that he has all power and authority. When our, uh, when our kids were younger, at night, they would, they would get scared of the dark. Have y'all ever been scared of the dark before? When you were little, if you've had kids that have been scared of the dark and you're like, guys, we just prayed. Like, how are you scared? There's nothing under your bed, we, you know. And so, but we, we learned early on that this was an opportunity to train them because throughout our lives, we will face things that feel intimidating. And so we would say, okay, okay, here's what I want you to do. First, I want you to pray that God would protect you from anything in the name of Jesus. And then we would teach them this verse. And it was all about, you know, when you lie down, your sleep will, will be sweet right? You'll have peace. Just remember that verse and then sing worship songs. Just sing worship songs. Because what, we, we just want them to remember the truth. Oh, God is good. God is loving. He's here. He's for me, right? We're just training them how to be free from the fear of evil. So Jesus sets the oppressed free. He operates in freedom, freedom from the fear of man, the fear of death, and the fear of of evil. And here's what I hope you understand. You can too. You can too. Unless you let your core fears dominate you. And if you do that, then a woman who's been in a condition for 18 plus years will probably stay that way. Okay? But Jesus... He's come to transfer us from the dominion of fear into the kingdom of God. You can be free. It is possible. It is possible in Jesus. Just hear that for me. If you felt those things, if you feel those things right now, you can know that there's freedom for you in Jesus Christ. And just as the father was not content to let a woman stay in that condition any longer, the Lord is not content to let his children stay in fear or oppression. Here's the last thing that I think we should understand. Free people, free people. You ever heard the, the old saying, hurt people hurt people? Why'd they hurt me? Well, they're hurting. Well, Jesus, the freest person to ever walk the planet, 
started a chain reaction of freedom. I mean, what did the apostles do after Jesus resurrects and ascends to the Father? They go out and they do all the stuff that Jesus just did. They step into situations that should have been too intimidating for them. They say things that they probably would have been scared to say. They, they, they do things that they would have been like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And it was this chain reaction of freedom. They had been in the presence of Jesus. They had seen this freedom. They had experienced the freedom for themselves. And then they were actually able to extend the freedom of Jesus to other people. What, what happens with Philip in Samaria? He's not even one of the apostles. He was just a faithful dude that they made a deacon. And then he's scattered by the persecution, and he does the same things. Read church history, the church fathers. All these people throughout time, what happens? Free people are freeing people. Free people are freeing people. It's a chain reaction that Jesus has begun. Freedom begets freedom. What does freedom in action look like? We find it in Jesus, free from the fear of man, free from the fear of death, free from the fear of evil. And I just want to echo the words of Jesus over you today. You are free. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.